For our final segment today, we're going to be sharing my interview with environmental and human rights lawyer Stephen Donziger. For those of you who haven't heard Steve Donziger's story, it is truly, truly, truly one of the most terrifying examples of how much legal power corporations are now wielding here in the United States. The summary is this. About a decade ago, Steve Donziger won a landmark climate settlement from oil giant Chevron for polluting giant swaths of the Ecuadorian rainforest, which poisoned and killed thousands of indigenous Ecuadorians. But rather than pay the damages, Chevron, the oil giant, decided to use its massive high-paid legal team to go directly after Steve Donziger, the lawyer, and sue him for fraud. They found a corporate-friendly judge in the Southern District of New York to preside over the case, who then charged Steve with criminal contempt of court and placed him on house arrest. After the U.S. Attorney's Office declined to prosecute the contempt case, that same judge used an obscure legal loophole to appoint a private law firm to criminally prosecute Stephen. And the law firm he chose works, wait, sorry, and the law firm the judge chose has in the past worked with Chevron. You heard that right. This is essentially the first ever corporate prosecution of a U.S. citizen. In other words, the state gave a private law firm the power to criminally, not civilly, but criminally prosecute Steve Donziger. And they did it. This judge did this after prosecutors, federal prosecutors in New York, declined to prosecute Donziger. In other words, Federal prosecutors said, no, nah, we're not going to prosecute him. There's not really a case here. And the judge used his power under a very obscure law to appoint a private Chevron-connected law firm to nonetheless prosecute Steve Donziger. Oh, and also, remember that case I told you about in Ecuador, this, the case that Steve Donziger originally won? Chevron has still not paid a single penny of that original settlement. Steven Donziger was kind enough to sit down with me and update us on the status of his case, but also on the status of what it means for the legal system and for people challenging the fossil fuel industry in the years ahead. Hey, Steven, how you doing? Great, good to be here. Uh, first of all, tell us, just remind everyone, you're, you're now out of jail, you're a free man uh, after, uh, how long were you in, in custody in, uh, under house arrest and in prison? 993 days and um, 26 months of that over two years was prior to my misdemeanor trial. I was detained at home with an ankle bracelet. So, you know, misdemeanor, you know, the normal maximum sentence is six months in prison. And for a first time offender like me, a lawyer is almost you never hear of anyone getting even a day of jail time and i ended up spending almost three years on a on a supposed crime which i still assert my innocence for um for you know almost three years so you know i i served uh over 10 times longer than the previous maximum longest sentence ever given a lawyer for misdemeanor contempt which is what i was convicted of the case in which this all revolved around uh, for folks who don't know the broad strokes, you basically won, helped indigenous people win the largest case uh, against uh, Chevron and the fossil fuel industry uh, in, uh, in Latin America. Uh, one of the biggest cases, probably the biggest case in, in history. And Chevron essentially then used the American legal system to uh, try to punish you. Uh, and that thus and so the 900 days. I think the thing moving forward beyond that that's so terrifying about your case in a sort of precedential kind of way is the use of private of a private law firm, a Chevron connected private law firm that was employed by the state, by the uh, uh, the the government uh, against you. For folks who don't really understand what that means, just tell that story. Well, I'll say at the outset, not just any law firm. This was a law firm that had Chevron as a client, 
Chevron being the entity against whom I helped my clients win this historic judgment. So basically what happened um, to distill it down, you know, I worked for years with other lawyers for really almost 20 years down in Ecuador in the Amazon, helping indigenous peoples win this enormous pollution judgment against Chevron. I'll say during that trial, Chevron engaged in all sorts of unsavory, unethical tactics to delay and obstruct the trial. We ended up overcoming that. We won the trial. Um, they refused to pay. And at that point, they targeted me here in the United States with the help of a, of a federal judge, really two federal judges with ties to the Federalist Society, who had come out of that same dynamic that just produced this spate of completely extremist Supreme Court decisions um, that we've seen over the last couple of weeks. So that dynamic, I think, allowed this judge who comes out of that world um, to help Chevron target me. And he charged me with criminal contempt of court for no good reason. Um, he claimed that my appeal of a civil discovery order that I turned over my computer to Chevron, which is just unprecedented, um, somehow constituted a crime, appealing it. I had a pending appeal on his order. Um, he then had me locked up, again, unprecedented for a misdemeanor offense prior to trial. He claimed I was a risk of flight. This was all a process to try to criminalize me, to punish me for my successful human rights advocacy on behalf of indigenous peoples. And ultimately, when he took these what I think are bogus charges against me for not giving my computer to Chevron. Um, he took him to the U.S. attorney here in Manhattan who refused to prosecute me. At that point, he, the judge, Lou Kaplan, appointed a private law firm to go after me as if they were the U.S. government without disclosing the fact that the law firm had Chevron as a client. So essentially, Chevron, as a private corporation, took control of the prosecutorial machinery, obviously normally a public function in our society, they privatized it, turned it against me, and had me locked up for this unprecedented period of time to retaliate against my successful advocacy on behalf of indigenous peoples that held them accountable for probably some of the world's worst oil pollution down in the Amazon. So the I want to go back to this point to underscore it. The New York prosecutors, the U.S. Attorney's Office, declines to prosecute you. Uh, based on these allegations that Chevron made uh, uh, against you, allegations about um, uh, the sort of they allege uh, uh, misconduct in the original case. Yeah. They bring it to the U.S. attorney, like the prosecutors. The prosecutors are like, no, we're, we don't see the case here. We're not prosecuting it. The judge in the case then uses this obscure part of the law to effectively have you prosecuted by a private law firm. So I think that's the part that is so mind blowing. Uh, and it came up again, I believe, this issue came up again very recently uh, in June. Just talk to us how it came up again, how you tried to challenge that. And here's the, the bigger question. What does it mean moving forward that judges appointed, for instance, by let's say Donald Trump, in theory, are now uh, there's now a precedent that says they can appoint uh, private prosecutors to prosecute people they don't like. Well, I, I, you know, you raise a critical issue. But, you know, my view of this, first of all, my prosecution by a private entity is unprecedented, not only in U.S. history. I haven't seen one example of this even in any other country. Um, so the idea that the United States, you know, brags about being a rule of law country and we look at what's happened recently, both writ large and in my case, like we have serious flaws right now going on in terms of, you know, look, we all know about the problems of police racism and the problems in our carceral system. This is a different kind of problem that is really disturbing. It's a problem of corporate control over the prosecutorial apparatus to target activists who take on the fossil fuel industry, which is me. And it's happening not just to me, I've sort of the most visible case, perhaps, but it's happening to a lot of people who protest oil pipelines. You know, line three people, Jessica Reznicek, who has deemed a terrorist, now serving eight years for putting a blowtorch to a pipeline. She harmed nobody. She's not a terrorist. OK, she's a, she engaged in civil disobedience. So it's not just me. It's happening as part of a playbook by the industry. Normally, they can easily find prosecutors to do their bidding. What's unusual here is they couldn't because I live in New York and I think there's more sophistication here in terms of the U.S. Attorney's Office than in many places. So when they turn the judge down, the judge just engaged in what I believe is a nakedly corrupt act 
and had me prosecuted directly by a Chevron law firm and had me locked up. I mean, I never would have been prosecuted, much less locked up if it was a normal prosecutor. They never, people don't get locked up in America on misdemeanors prior to trial. It just doesn't happen. So why was I locked up for two years and two months? Obviously, it's because it's a Chevron law firm who was prosecuting me. And I will say this, I think it's very important people, I'm glad you're bringing this up, David, it's important people understand the connection between my case, the fossil fuel industry, the climate issue, okay? They don't want people like me doing this work successfully. Yeah, the system tolerates lots of people doing this and that, but they we've gotten it to a very high level. We won a $10 billion judgment on behalf of people with no money, you know, indigenous peoples. That's really threatening, not only to Chevron, but to the entire industry, because they know they have literally trillions of dollars of legacy environmental liability in dozens of countries around the world. If this model succeeds in making that transfer of money that was legitimately won by the people of Ecuador down to Ecuador to do a cleanup, their whole business model is going to be under threat. So they want to snuff out this case by destroying me and my life, my reputation, I will say they have failed. I'm here speaking and I'm cool and we're gonna continue the work. But their goal was to snuff me out, to send a message of intimidation to every young activist, every young campaigner, every lawyer who's even thinking about doing this work. And I'm telling you, they have failed. The case is going on. And not only that, it's backfired because the reason I'm talking to you and the reason I'm getting a lot of attention now is because they locked me up. I mean, very few people had actually heard about this case five years ago. And now there's literally tens of millions of people who are deeply into it, including 68 Nobel laureates, 120 human rights groups have asked Biden to pardon me. We're growing. We're getting stronger. And I think ultimately Chevron is going to have to pay this judgment. I keep going back to this separation of powers issue, which seems um, which seems kind of esoteric, but is actually terrifying. We've seen a lot of talk about the judicial coup that is underway in America, the, this third branch of government that doesn't get as much attention, uh, that has, has been seen as apolitical. I think a lot of people are now uh, shaken into awareness that at, that at the Supreme Court level, there is this kind of judicial coup happening, a kind of uh, rampage to repeal the 20th century. I put this case inside of that judicial coup in the following way, that this ruling that came down as you appealed your contempt, uh, the contempt conviction, um, this ruling that came down by this, this uh, lower federal court reaffirmed the idea that a judge can appoint a prosecutor if the judge doesn't like that the executive branch's prosecutor uh, isn't prosecuting a case. And if that sounds technical and esoteric, but it seems to me that the way the Constitution was created was to separate the prosecutorial power from the judging power, right? The executive branch, which is which is directly accountable to people voting in a president, uh, puts in place the prosecutors who decide what cases to bring. And then this separate branch over here judges the case. What, what this contempt case reaffirmed in your case very recently is that actually the court is saying, if we don't like that the executive branch isn't prosecuting somebody, we, the ju judicial branch, can appoint our own prosecution. Don't, there is no check on our power, right? We get to be ju judge and prosecutor. And, and then you think of the, the ramifications of that. The Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump have focused so much on putting judges into not only the Supreme Court, but all throughout, you know, con very conservative judges into the judicial system. Now you think those judges potentially cannot necessarily be checked by a presidential election. I mean, tell me if I'm wrong in fearing the implications of this. I think you're right, and I think it's terrifying. And, and you know, look, I don't really care about people's politics. I mean, I've had lawyers from out of the Federalist Society, like right-wing lawyers and judges, hyper-offended by this complete violation of separation of powers orchestrated by an oil company to serve its private interests, to take over the public machinery to serve private interests, okay? 
So this has never happened before. We have to be sure, in my opinion, that it doesn't happen again, which is why I'm out here talking about it. I will say this, which is, and your description of the separation of powers problems is exactly dead on. You know, you know, in our society, it is the executive branch that prosecutes crime. Judges, I'm sorry to tell you, you can't actually prosecute crime in our society. You can judge the case. You cannot, uh, you know, make the charges and appoint the prosecutor and control the private prosecutor and be the basically the judge and the grand jury and the jury in the same case. And that's what Judge Kaplan did to me. It's, it, you know, it's. Look, beyond being an embarrassment, frankly, to the New York federal judiciary where he sits and where this is being tolerated, beyond being an embarrassment, in my opinion, to Judge Kaplan himself and being an embarrassment, frankly, to our country, because this completely undermines or any moral authority the U.S. might have to talk about what human rights means in a rule of law context. What happened to me? You know, this is just I'm, I'm just ashamed for our country as a lawyer that this happened. And I just want to make one final point. My conviction under this private prosecutorial regime, and by the way, I was not given a jury. Kaplan appointed the judge. It was all a rigged system, okay, guaranteed to convict me. I couldn't even put on a defense. Um, I appealed this. And what you're talking about in June is a decision that came down by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. It was a 2-1 decision affirming my conviction. But all three judges were extremely bothered by the private prosecution. The one judge who dissented, Judge Menashe, was appointed by Donald Trump. Now, why do I bring this up? Judge Menashe wrote 19-page dissent, where he said, I would avoid this whole thing. This is crazy. This is unconstitutional. On the basis of that framework, my lawyers, my excellent lawyer, Stephen Vladek from the University of Texas, Austin, is my lead appellate lawyer, are bringing this up to the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, call me crazy. Obviously, that court, and particularly the sixth justices who have staged the judicial coup, and it is a judicial coup, make no mistake about it, um, are not going to have any sympathy for me or the work I do personally. But there is a strand of thinking in right-wing legal circles right now that go there is government overreach. I mean, the whole EPA decision that just came down was designed to make government back off from regulating the industry to, to basically render government inactive in terms of what its role should be in our society. Well, ironically, bizarrely, what Judge Kaplan did to me is an example in their minds of massive judicial overreach, governmental overreach. And not only not only that, in the EPA decision, if I'm if I'm correct, the EPA decision was kind of an extremist uh, vision of separation of powers yes. to the point where they were arguing, you know, the Congress can't delegate any authority <laughs> to the executive branch. Now you're going to be bringing a case where you're going to be simply saying to them, OK, listen, if, if if you have that extremist interpretation of separation of powers, then here's a case where the judiciary now, granted, it's the Supreme Court's own own branch, so they may be biased towards it. But you're, you're basically going to say to them, if you're worried about separation of powers, here's a situation where I need you. We want you to invalidate the idea that the judiciary can be the executive branch and the judiciary can be the prosecutor and the judge at the same time. Yeah, that's exactly right. And look, as I said, you know, look, I'm, I'm a progressive lawyer activist. I care about environmental issues and other progressive issues, but that's not what this case is about now on appeal at this point. It really is about a separation of powers issue that threatens free speech, free advocacy and freedom in our society. And I think that you know, look, I get, you know, it's complicated, it's complex, and it's technical, but I really do think that this might get a sympathetic ear in a Supreme Court that otherwise, to me, has gone rogue. You know, so I'm just trying to point out that there's just bizarre things happening. The fundamental problem, though, is we cannot have private corporate prosecutions in the United States or America or any other country. It's illegal. It violates the rule of law. And it happened to me. And if it can happen to me, it can happen to you. So I need people to pay attention to this. By the way, if I could just mention, I have a website called freedonziger.com. You can learn more about this. You can help. We have a defense fund. This is expensive to deal with. Please donate if you can. But more importantly, learn about it. Spread the word. It's freedonziger.com. More and more people need to hear about this. Otherwise, we're not going to be able to stop it. You know, it strikes me that there is an analog here. I mentioned that I, I see this as part of the judicial coup. 
It strikes me that also what's going on here fits into the judicial coup in this way. One thing that we've reported at The Lever is that the right has worked very hard using money in politics to surround the court on both sides, both in the prosecution and the, and the judges, essentially buying Supreme Court seats, uh, buying uh, Senate seats to then get nominations through, and then also funding and buying basically attorneys general seats in the states so that the, the Republican attorneys general are now are then bringing cases to Republican bought uh, judges, Republican bought court seats. It strikes me that this is almost a similar situation in the sense of Chevron has a lot of power. Uh, Chevron is connected to all sorts of law firms. Chevron doesn't like that uh, a U.S. attorney in New York doesn't prosecute you. So uh, a judge doesn't like that that the U.S. attorney isn't prosecuting you. So the judge can appoint a Chevron connected law firm to come after you. I mean, I guess I guess the question is, do you see this entire thing as part of a larger uh, effort, a larger campaign to really manipulate the judiciary and make it not independent. Not, I mean, I don't think it's ever fully been independent. I think that's kind of a myth. But I feel like there's a, this is all part of a larger strategy to kind of really strip away the last forms of independence that exist in our judiciary system. Well, I'd go a step further. I think you're right. I think it's a little bit worse than that. I mean, they're trying the corporate elites and the corporate, you know, the the, the I'd say the the sort of the right side of the corporate world, this is the fossil fuel industry, the U.S. Chamber, the Koch brothers funding network, et cetera, the Federalist Society, et cetera, are trying to control our society writ large. Right. You know, and the way they have decided to do that, that is the weak point, the easiest path for their money to control 320 million people is through the Supreme Court. The unelected branch of government, okay, the one unelected branch of government, because the major they know the majority is totally opposed to all of these steps the Supreme Court has taken. So, as you know, and as you've written about, and I salute you because you do great journalism, this has been a multi-decade strategy to basically go to that one little place where all their money can guarantee the optimum and the maximum amount of control over the rest of us, and they finally got it done through, you know, getting Donald Trump in, who was not, did not win the popular vote. He had three judicial appointments. And as you point out in your recent article, which I think is critical people read, I tweeted this, this has been enabled by a Democratic Party that does not know how to deal with it. Okay, it's that simple. Whether it's Joe Biden, whether it's Barack Obama, et cetera, et cetera, John Kerry, Al Gore, this goes back 20, 25 years where there was basically the, the, they were laying the groundwork for a right wing judicial coup that we just saw the result of. It was just completed for 20, 25 years. And the Democratic Party was asleep, largely in my view, because it was accepting the same corporate fossil fuel money from the Koch brothers and others that took control of the Republican Party. So, you know, as you point out, until we find a create a party in this country that can actually stand up to this and play hardball with this, it's going to keep going. And, and I think that is the critical issue facing our society right now. I think the good news, there is good news here. I think the good news is, is that for for decades, the court has been seen wrongly, in my view. And, and it's, it's, it's boggled my mind and driven me crazy for as long as I've worked in and around politics and media, that the public has seen uh, the court as this sort of apolitical, tribunal of elders. And I mean, and that goes back, I mean, that goes back a long, long time. I mean, it even, it was even in FDR's time until he decided to have the fight with the courts. And I think there's a whole lot of historical revisionism about, you know, whether he was successful or not in, in the public's mind. It's, oh, it was unsuccessful. Actually, he wasn't unsuccessful. His fight with the court was highly successful, but he was even back then fighting against this public perception that the court is apolitical. And that has, has existed even into uh, after Bush v. Gore, right? Oh, the court is still apolitical, right? Right. A whole bunch of nonsense. But I think the good news when you look at polls now, I think people are starting to get it. And I think that is where you might finally start to get a larger political movement and pressure on a Democratic Party to actually start having a conflict with the judiciary and not continue to pretend that ju the judiciary is just calling balls and strikes and they're apolitical. That's a bunch of horseshit. It's and really you're 
couldn't agree with this, really started when, when Al Gore accepted that BS decision that basically stole the White House from him. Yes. I mean, he, he was weak. And at that point, he should have laid down a marker and said, this is illegitimate. This court does not deserve legitimacy. It just made a political decision, okay, to, to steal the election from the people. And that was the first big step in this coup that we now see culminated in all these, you know, these five or six decisions in the last two weeks. Do you know how you know the judiciary? I always say this to, to friends of mine. You know how you know the judiciary and the Supreme Court is a political institution? Mitch McConnell has been obsessed with every single court appointment for 20 or 25 years. It's his, it's his obsession above all else. If you look at Mitch McConnell, he's, he's involved in all sorts of issues. You would have to put at the top of the list, the thing that Mitch McConnell obsesses over is every single judicial appointment. And the point being is that guy does not obsess over apolitical things. That guy obsesses over highly political things. That guy has been obsessed with, with infiltrating that institution for a quarter century. And he's been aided and abetted by a Democratic Party that has continued to effectively pretend that it, that the judiciary, as it's being rigged, is just legitimate and worse above political criticism. But I think that your case has played a pivotal role. I think the Supreme Court's rulings have played a pivotal role in spotlighting that this is an institution that needs to be challenged because it is trying to uh, repeal the 20th century. And on climate change, it is trying to help the fossil fuel industry effectively uh, destroy the livable ecosystem. So I want to thank you for waging the fight that you've waged. And I want to thank you for continuing to push it, right? I mean, you you got out of, uh, out of prison and you're continuing to push this. You could have just sort of disappeared. And I very much appreciate you continuing to push this because this this really is the issue of our age. It Thank is. you so much. Thank you, David, for having me. Keep up the great work on your end. Really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you.